they are uh, vulnerable groups. So they are either families, patients, uh, pregnant women with kids, uh, or uh, handicaps. Um, so I would like to touch upon a little bit about what it is so. Uh, just to be aware, the funding came from Chatham House, it's an independent documentary, so the aim was not to we're not politically affiliated with anyone out there. So this was an independent product which had like a small budget from Chatham House, but it was only for operational costs. And my idea behind and my colleague's idea behind is to show a little bit some positive examples and some positive practices that we really do exist in Greece, even in these harsh times, economic, economically, politically, socially speaking. There are some good examples out there. So uh, you, you should know that this documentary was uh, took place last year in January 2017. No, 16, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was like one and a half years ago. Uh, so lots of things have changed, they have shifted because it's, 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 it's a very rapid situation, it changes all the time. Um, we were in a post-emergency emergency situation at the time uh, and most of the people, they were kind of blocked in Greece, in these two centers, they were blocked because they were waiting either, either for their education, for, I mean, for those who are not very, of you who are not very well about, aware about the asylum procedure, either the way we were waiting for the decision on their asylum claim or they were waiting of the decision on their relocation uh, within the relocation methods. Uh, so most of these um, uh, people that you saw in the camp, in the second video, in the city camp, where you have the teacher uh, talking about, they were waiting, uh, they were like uh, separated. So they had dad or mom in Germany, let's say, or in the European Union. And they were in uh, the rest of the family, most of them Syrians, they were waiting in the city center in order to be relocated. So this was um, it was not a rapid process. So as they said in their videos, they were waiting for one or one and a half year uh, because the process is so slow due to different constraints, like uh, not, not lots of people were based uh, on the ground on the asylum service due to financial constraints. Um, again, there were limited uh, people, there was a limited uh, amount of people recruited by the asylum service. Um, and also in Karatepe, again, the, the Karatepe is in Lesbos Island, or like very close to the Turkish shore. Uh, most of them were families, not all, only Syrians, Afghanis and uh, Iraqis were and are also based here. So my point is that most of the people that you have seen in these videos, they are not in the centers anymore, okay? So with most of them, um, okay, of course we have a personal uh, relationship with most of them, because otherwise it would be impossible to show them it would be impossible for them to share their lives with us. Uh, so most of them have been, they are now in Germany. Most of the kids that you saw, especially uh, at the second video in the city, is in the place, in the south, the west, let's say, part of Greece. Most of them, they managed, they did it, and they are in Germany. They have acquired, acquired uh, full refugee status. So they have uh, access right now to education, they have uh, legal papers, they have residence permits, and most of them, uh, they are trying to have access to labor, which is one of the most uh, challenging and problematic, I would say, uh, parts of the asylum procedure, or of what happens after you get your refugee papers uh, within the European Union, within the EU. Uh, so, some other things that I would like to um, underline and that we saw at the videos is uh, the role of, of the volunteers and the solidarity-based initiatives. Uh, the first video is from Nassos, who is a Greek, uh, and uh, Mary, who is a Palestinian, and um, they were participating in the search and rescue operations where the big flows uh, were coming at the shores from Turkey uh, to the Greek islands. 
so they raised how important it was to volunteer because part of the time the Greek state was not prepared enough due to various reasons. We can discuss about that if you're happy with that afterwards. Uh, they were not prepared now, it was a very new situation um, about Greece. There was not a precedent, let's say, of all these big flows, of all these high numbers that uh, they entered Greece. Um, of course, now the situation is slightly different, but at the time there were lots of NGOs, international and local ones, which came to help, to support, to do legal aid, social uh, work, uh, etc. So now most of them, they, they are gone. Of course, the problem uh, is still there. The refugee issue is still there. Of course, the media in Greece and in Europe, they're not talking a lot about that, but people are, all, are still brought at the Eastern Indian Islands. Uh, I was checking this morning the latest number, it's something like 30, 13,000. Now, by the people, it's stuck 13, 13,000 um, asylum seekers, we call them. So, most of them have applied for asylum and they are blocked at the Eastern Aegean Islands. So, this is the official number by UNHCR. And uh, of course, there are uh, something like 22,000 accommodation places. That they are, uh, they have been available by UNHCR and different uh, NGOs for accommodation at, in the mainland, including no, the mainland. I'm sorry, mainland and islands. Uh, this is not enough, and these places are only for vulnerable groups. So we have a high number, but we do not have uh, lots of places uh, to accommodate them properly. So the, the, the priority is a vulnerable group. So if you have a vulnerable group. Um, let's say in Lesbos, uh, then he, this vulnerable case, he can ask for asylum and he can be transferred to the mainland. Otherwise, he remains blocked and awaiting for his asylum claim and the others doing uh, nothing. The only thing, as we saw in the videos, is participating at some community-based uh, events, backed by local authorities and backed uh, by uh, NGOs and uh, some volunteers in Greece and uh, foreigners. Um, another issue that I would like to today is based on what you saw, and I mean the idea was to put the refugees' voices um, uh, in these videos. So if you just had the, the chance to see Ahmed and Iba, the couple, and then Kirama, uh, the lady, the last lady in the last video. So more, more, all of them are Syrians. Uh, the two, uh, the couple, used, they used to do their studies in Syria, so they were qualified, well-educated. And what I would like to highlight is their, uh, number one, for the trauma, okay? They, they suffered from trauma after they did, they crossed dangerously uh, from Turkey to Greece. Uh, so you, we could see that they, were, they, they have suffered from this dangerous journey and you could see that in the way they were talking, they were, uh, the way they were expressing themselves and they were in Greece doing nothing because they were, they were waiting for the decision, they were, uh, the process was really slow, uh, they had ruined their, basically their daily life. So another issue that they raised when we were talking to them was that if the war stops, they would like to return. So this, I would say that this was a trend amongst those that I met on the ground. And of course, access to work and labor remains another challenge for them. They used to work back in their country of origin, and they they still want to work in Europe. So. This is what they, they most of them, they, they said to us. This couple now is in Sweden, if I'm not wrong. So they have also acquired their papers and they're trying to uh, normalize their life. Uh, and the last lady that you saw, she used to be the director in a van in Damascus. And she was there with her three, or three kids and, the, and her husband's one in Germany. 
So again, she she underlined the fact that the fact that she is not working um, is a problem for her, and this is what she wants to do in Europe. Um, then another very important issue is the issue of education of the kids. So in Greece, there was a there was a there was a governmental plan to integrate the kids and. <coughs> provided education to them. It was run problematically. As Vasiliki said, uh, she, she's a, a teacher in, in a small village. She said that it's very important to integrate the kids, but how can we do that? In order to do that, we need to put the Greek kids with, with uh, the Syrian and the Afghan kids together. Even if this sounds really challenging and difficult, it's difficult. The only way to integrate them. For example, when I visited the center, the kids were having class uh, in the African, so the Syrian kids, um, the refugee kids, let's say, they were having their classes. In the afternoon, kids, they're having like, the class. There was no interaction, there was uh, no to this. And um, another thing, and I think if you have any. Any questions about the numbers, about the term, uh, give you some more information. Is what Fotini said. Uh, Fotini, she is a humanitarian advisor. Uh, she was working in nationalism in Africa because she was based in um, as a Okay, so the latest number is something like 115 arrivals per day. Even if we have a different deal, uh, maybe uh, you can discuss more about this, can discuss more about that. Uh, people still arrive on the islands. Of course, it's not the ratio as it used to be uh, before in 2015. But uh, there is still an issue there, and Greece still struggles to cope with the numbers. And uh, I think we can open it up if you like a little bit more. Uh, so basically, right now in Greece, if I'm not mistaken, the, the, the official number of people it's 25,000 refugees. Most of them are asked for asylum. Of course, there is a big debate how uh, if all of them they can be classified as refugees for economic migrants uh, because most of the Syrians they, they went to Europe or they most of them who could not cross the Turkey. Turkey is another debate, Turkey, EU, Greece. I'm mostly focused on EU and Greece because this is my expertise, and also Greece is an EU member state, so Greece is obliged to follow the EU key regarding asylum and uh, uh, migration policies. And also, I ended up here, and one of the most important messages that I would like to stress is that. Uh, small is beautiful, and so small initiatives, small scale projects, um, volunteering because you all you, you are students, most of you are students here. So uh, it's not, it's not, it's not in our country. It's not happening in our country, but it's next to our country. So in the videos, it was stated that any one of us could be a refugee, which is, I think, it's true. So having a human eye and trying to see things in a more uh, human way could help sometimes uh, tackle this kind of crisis. 
And also the role of youth is really important and we are still young. We can still do some uh, important things for people next to us. I leave it here and thanks a lot. Because we were, I mean, because we watched something about the island side, because there were like several references to the EU Turkey statement, which is also known as the EU Turkey deal, I wanted to give you certain numbers, and you know, and I also have many issues about this agreement, and I wanted to underline my issues as well. I mean, I have many issues about many things in life, but this is specifically something that. Um, I am bothered. Let us show some cartoons in the meantime to entertain you a bit. But I mean, basically, I'm sure many of you in this room are familiar with the so called deal, right? Are we familiar? Do we know what is expected from the deal? I mean, A, visa liberalization for the Turkish citizens, citizens of the Republic of Turkey, was one thing that was how actually this deal was promoted in Turkey. Um, B, there won't be any loss of lives. C, we will be promoting regular migration, regular relocation of asylum. And D, there will be financial aid provided by the EU towards Turkey, so that you know, like there will be certain integration projects continuing uh, for the sake of the Syrians and Turkey. So let's look at everything one by one. Um, one of the issues that I have with this deal is it, is, it has been presented in Brussels especially and, and, um, and with some, some, some groups in Turkey who are very pro-Europe, but as if migration and this deal can be a new area for cooperation. And this is really presented as if it is something very unique and new. In fact, we all know that migration agreements are not a new thing. I mean, if you look at the research conducted by Caserio, 2014, we see that the number of readmission agreements in Europe has been increasing since the 80s. So this is not a new tool that emerged overnight. So we, we have been familiar with that. And Turkey has also been familiar with readmission agreements. We have been trying to sign readmission agreements with a number of countries, um, usually countries of um, origin, and uh, we, can, we can say of irregular migrants. So I should underline this. Most of the time, actually, the readmission agreements have been utilized to fight, you know, so-called fighting against irregular migration. So the major problem that we are having with this deal, the EU Turkey deal, is that it directly affects asylum seekers. I mean, rightfully, Christina mentioned that yes, Greece has to study, I mean, has to abide by the rules of the European key. And you know, there are certain rules for, um, to figure out whether somebody is a genuine refugee or not. But in fact, um, looking at the relocation numbers from Greece to Western Europe, and Christina has already mentioned, many of them has in fact received asylum seekers. I mean, many of them has in fact received a refugee status. We could claim that the deal has a direct impact not only regular migrants, but those people who are genuine refugees. So, um, what, I mean, how did this deal affect the, the field in Turkey? 
Um, well, it doesn't really affect the numbers of Syrians in Turkey. These are all figures that I got from the, the website of the migration, the general migration manager of Turkey guys this morning. So you can see that the date is uh, 5th of April 2018. They are updating these figures every two weeks. So I mean, you should actually go online and check that in a couple of weeks. It is interesting. Um, because sometimes they share certain statistics, but then those statistics get lost. Um, at one point, they were, for example, sharing statistics about foreign fighters. For a couple of weeks, they done that, but then it stopped. And now you cannot find them anymore. Um, so anyways, if, if you look at the numbers, you know, like, there has been a gradual increase of the, the number of Syrian refugees um, who are under temporary protection in Turkey. Currently, the number seems to be 3.6. As I said, I have many issues about migration-related related, uh, topics, and I also have issues with these numbers. Um, how, how can I explain this? Well, many people claim that the number has been gradually increasing, and there are like 3.6 million Syrians in Turkey. If you ask many of the international organizations or you know, human rights group or civil society organizations, they will claim that yes, the number of registered Syrians in Turkey are 3.6, but more actually, like the actual number is 4.5. You know, like there's always this, this point of exaggeration. Um, I am not really sure whether the number is 3.6 million. The reason why I'm saying this, only in 2015, we know that almost 900,000 people crossed the sea and went to Greece. And we are not really sure how many of these people were actually registered in Turkey. So, I mean, when you ask the IOM, they would claim that Many of those people were not actually Syrians, but you know, also from other nationalities, and the and the and the clash between is like um, is, is very low. But we don't really know that because only last month, almost on a Sunday afternoon, I received a call from a friend. He said, "This is like, do you know anyone who can help me with, with a certain situation at Atatürk Airport?" He said, "Well, there is this young boy. He is around 22." He has a refugee status in Germany. He entered into Turkey two weeks ago. He went to visit his family, who was living in Adana, because the, uh, the family lost the father, the mom was not in a good situation, so the, the boy couldn't you know, like stand it anymore, so he decided to travel to Turkey. And then Saturday night, he was going to leave, but you know, the director general uh, of uh, migration management, you know, now they have also um, officers working at the airport, they didn't let them go. Because they said, you are also registered in Turkey under temporary protection. You should have actually got a permit to leave Turkey. You didn't. Now you have to get a permit to leave. This boy already entered Turkey with a passport from, you know, German authorities. Yes, I know this is a very small amount of evidence, and we should be actually doing more research about it. But you know, we, we should we should also we should be skeptical when we're talking about these numbers because you know the more the more asylum seekers you have, the better it is for um, receiving funds. So I'm I'm quite skeptical in that sense. As you all probably know, we have actually Syrians in in, in every province in, in Turkey. And if you look at the distribution of Syrians in the scope of um, temporary protection by the top 10 provinces, you see that Istanbul is leading the way. Kilis is the most interesting place to be because the local population of Kilis is as much as the number of Syrians, so it is almost one to one um, in, in the context of Kilis. So, um, it didn't really have any effect in the numbers in Turkey, I mean, the agreement. And a, and a large part of this agreement was to promote regular resettlement of Syrians from Turkey, right? I mean, for every Syrian that, I mean, for every irregular migrant that we would receive back based on this agreement, Europe promised to resettle one Syrian <coughs> to somewhere in Europe. And this didn't really happen. I mean, as you can see from the cartoon, you know, Merkel really proposed this. Um, but she couldn't really convince her colleagues to receive anybody. If you look at the statistical data, again from the DGMM, 
one-to-one um, -one policy, look at the numbers, based on this agreement only, there are other resettlement relocation quotas, I mean, there are some people, more people who are living, but by the way, those numbers also do not exceed, exceed thousands. Um, only 13,000 people were relocated to Europe based on this agreement. As you can see, Germany is leading the way, then comes Holland, France, Belgium, Malta received 17 people, Espania 46. As, as you can guess, I mean, Hungary is not on the list. Um, Austria received 213 people. I'm, also, I'm very actually obsessed about Austria in this case because the person who has lobbied so much for this agreement, which is the ESI, European Stability Initiative, they have been lobbying for this agreement very hardly. Uh, he's from Austria. And um, he thinks the whole world is Austria. And uh, I think because he, he was the one who proposed that this will add um, the beds along the Asian Sea and there will be actually regular reg regular migration instead of irregular, which is the sea, etc. Let me continue. Um, okay, this is the graph showing the fatality rate in the Asian Sea from 2015 to 2017. The numbers were as of August in 2017. I got this actually from the Missing Migrants Project of the IOM. They have established, I mean, they have written a report about the deal and about the, the number of uh, fatal frequency rates in the agency. I and mean, if you look at the numbers, I mean, the, the table shows the arrivals and the deaths. And don't misunderstand me. I mean, personally, not a single person should die on the sea, that's not my point. But basically, we cannot really claim, I'm looking at these numbers, we cannot really claim that the deal stopped the deaths on the sea. I mean, it really decreased the number of people who are trying to cross. It definitely has a deterrence effect. But if you actually look at the rates, I mean, the rates in fact have increased. Um, so, that's really a wrong argument in that sense, by the way, we look at the numbers. Um, Christina has already mentioned that there are many financial problems. Yes, um, but I mean, you can see that, that in September 2017, UNHCR urged action to ease conditions on Greek islands. MSF had a report in October calling on authorities to immediately relocate, relocate asylum seekers to the mainland. There were a survey, I mean, there was a survey that they have conducted, and the survey found that people who arrived on Samos after the EU Turkey deal was signed in, uh, that was signed in March 2016, reported more violence in Turkey and Greece than those who arrived before the deal came into force. So between 50% and 70% of that violence was allegedly committed by state authorities. So, I mean, there are issues of human rights, for sure. I mean, there is uh, There are no decreases in the number of civilians. I think that actually, I think around 2 billion of them has already been allocated to different projects. Another 3 billion is on the way. But as I said, I have issues with so many things in life, and I also have issues with this, because in fact, I'm not really sure whether this, um, the allocation, whether the EU or the donors are doing good enough to actually check the transparency of this spending of this money. I mean, I'm not really sure if this money is really touching the lives of the refugees or the migrants themselves. My point is, um, there are actually many people who have, like, for example, different, at least three certificates of entrepreneurship. But they still don't have jobs. So are usually spending money on, like, nice offices to give the entrepreneurship lessons and classes and more 
Time soon because although Turkey has actually um, done a lot for the roadmap, there is a stuck, and that stuck is about the terrible. The EU wants to make a change, uh, the EU wants Turkey to make a change in our terrible law. And um, given, the, given that the country is still under the state of emergency, I don't think it is going to happen anytime soon. So I'm, I'm quite skeptical about the deal, <coughs> and um. I'm not really sure if it is really making the people's mind in the, in the, in the field itself in any of them. So I will leave it up here for the question. Add one thing where the money goes. And uh, a friend of mine, Geo International, from the Olympic organization, dealing with refugees, tells me, and I don't know whether this is true or not, that out of you know every dollar spent or sent for uh, to international NGOs for to help refugees, about 10 cents actually ends up. That sense actually ends up in helping refugees directly because most of the money is spent, exactly as you said, in offices and salaries and other costs. Uh, and then this is part of the reality, also. Part of the, you know, we hear about billions that have been raised for this and that, but very little amount actually does go on the ground to the refugees. Is this something that uh, is, is a good case? Yeah. Uh, well, but, well, yes, I mean, the EU has actually. The EU has been quite transparent about where this money has been spent. For example, they can say how many children received you know, destination for all these projects, etc. But um, in fact, there was this cartoon, like the owner actually opens the water tap, the water is like you know, flowing very fast. And then it is the international organization receiving the money, and then the regional organization. And then this regional organization needs a local partner, so there is the local organization. And by the time the you know the, the, the migrant or, or the refugee opens a, this house to drink some water, it is you know, like only one, two drops. So this is this is exactly the problem. Um, and and my other issue is if you look at the projects that receive funding from the EU, because it is project based, as you know. You know, the, the Turkish government cannot directly receive the money. I mean, it's the usual suspects, if you look at the list. But in fact, if you're on the field, you would see that the mayor, for example, right? The mayor of, we, we, told, we saw the mayor of one of the Greek islands. In the, in the case of Istanbul, or in the, in the case of Antet, Kiyas, it is usually the municipalities, right? Who are dealing with the daily issues of these people directly. But in fact, there is no single municipality who is receiving funding from the EU, for example. Most of the money is going either to the international NGOs or the ministries. So those who are having day-to-day -day, day -day interaction with the migrants cannot receive funds. That is another problem. Good. Hello, my name is Seda and uh, I work for uh, Asam in Istanbul, the Association for Asylum Seekers and Migrants. Uh, I would like to first thank Asam uh, to bring uh, up the issue of whether the register, uh, whether the people, Syrian people registered here in Turkey are counted of the total number when they leave from Turkey. Um, this was something that I didn't think of you know, people before and for sure as a person who works in the field when someone asks uh, me about the number of people, Syrian people in Turkey, I would 
also argue on that, and let's hope uh, the registration renewal project of um, migration uh, director, sorry, the general director of, of migration management, uh, will provide us with uh, more exact numbers. Uh, hello? They all can. Yes, this is as much as we could get. And I will also to thank you for adding uh, more to my ethical dilemma, which I experience almost uh, each other day uh, when I try to decide how to direct our emergency cash assistance to refugees by saying that um, from the funds the EU, the EU provides actually how uh, much the um, refugees get. Thank you for that also. And um, I have a question to you, uh, Mr. Puenza. You said that by saying um, relocation, I mean, I think you both meant the uh, resettlement procedure to third countries and relocation within Greece. And I would like to ask more information about the relocation process in Greece I and mean, what is the percentage of urban refugees in the mainland, mainland compared to the refugees living on islands and uh, if you have any um, detailed information about how this process is managed by the Greek authorities. Thank you. I have a follow up to that. Can I add that? It's related to his question, so I'm Henry Bullos. I'm from the Netherlands. I work in, in the same field, so I will hope that I can contact you afterwards and I will not eat the time of other people here. But uh, I completely agree with the conundrum of the numbers. I have been uh, on less or and, and uh, you mean they are not registered. What you know now, today, for instance, the new wave from Afghanistan, about 40, 45,000. In the past three months only, half of them is not registered. Why are they not registered? Because <clears throat> there is in the fairway the mafia, organized crimes coming. We know about child abuse, child labor, exploitation. We know about people who do not register the children because they sell them. These are horrible stories. Uh, but I agree, and that is the big picture. Small is beautiful, but the bigger picture is a little bit different. I think my guess is, according to my countings and uh, sources, we have about four and a half million uh, Syrian refugees, the others not counted. And this is also not counted, the, 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 the figures from, the new figure from the past uh, two months, uh, what the effect of, for instance, of, of the bombing, you, you know, they are all increasing the inflow. This is not going to stop. And I think this is a very important debate. General debate. This is a, trans, a transient thing. This will go over. This is one wave like a tsunami, and then it is gone. It is not. This is going on, and to, to my uh, in my view, if we connect this with a much bigger problem, the problem of climate change, then this is just the tip of an iceberg. But Actually, um, I will comment a little bit on the last point that you mentioned. 
Of course, displacement is a big issue right now. Climate change is going to be, and displacement, I think, is going to be, and it should be part of the general debate on migration. Of course, we have new tools and new uh, instruments like the global com compact on migration, but it lacks lots of uh, heated issues, uh, in my opinion. So we see that uh, there are states that they want to tackle the issue, but there is not a coordinated, let's say, response or mechanism in order to, uh, let's say, uh, manage migration or to tackle the issue of displacement. 60 million uh, people is, is a high number. Um, so when it comes to uh, to what you said about registration, of course, there were lots of uh, lots of problems, especially when we have the big flows in Greece, that there was a, a lack of appropriate and effective registration by the national authorities. Uh, and lots of EU member states, they have criticized Greece for uh, lacking, uh, for, for lack of effective registration. Uh, that's, that's the reality, of course. But at the time, I think one of the problems was that there were high flows, so it was a pragmatic um, uh, issue. Then you had the inefficiency of the authorities. But now I think the situation has shifted. Of course, I'm, I'm sure that you said that you, you have experienced lack of registration still in Greece because you said you went in Lesbos. Uh, there is Dublin. Dublin is there, so Greece should be abided by the EU norms and should proceed to, uh, as the first country of entry, it should uh, do appropriate registration. Uh, I think the situation has slightly, uh, it's, it's made it's been better uh, due to the fact that lots of um, that Greece has been assisted by uh, the EASO, by EU officials to do uh, fingerprinting and better uh, registration. They have been much more uh, personnel deployed at the islands, Greeks, although they, they, there are lots of restraints in the budget of the ministries. Of course, then the counter argument is that but there is a lot of EU aid to Greece, yes, that's another big issue. A lot of money has been channeled into Greece right now, but there are lots of pragmatic problems like uh, the absorption of, of funds. There's a problematic uh, absorption of EU funds because of the lack of expertise within the ministries, and of course because of the huge bureaucracy, to be, to be honest, within the Greek mechanism. Um, now, coming back to your question, uh, I can give you more information about uh, the numbers. Unfortunately, I don't have in front of them. But when we're talking about relocation and resettlement, these are two different mechanisms, okay? So resettlement, as you quite said, is uh, the relocation, let's say, from uh, the country they are in to the third, to the relocation to the third country, most of the Resettling countries, most of them the US and Canada, and US Canada and Australia, like the biggest, they receive the biggest numbers. We see that there's a very problematic issue about resettlement. We don't talk a lot into the academic fora and uh, about resettlement because I think it's something that states and uh, UNHCR as well they don't want to touch upon, uh, but it's a very big and crucial issue that it concerns uh, also Turkey and uh, third countries. And when we talk about relocation, it had to do with mainly two countries, Italy and Greece, huh? like because they were uh, border countries. So relocation means uh, transfer from Greece or Italy to the EU, the EU member states. As far as I know, the relocation, um, most of Greece has, has managed, even in a very slow pace and ratio, to relocate most of the people. But as you saw in the videos, the people that they had, um, the asylum seekers that they had expressed their consent uh, to be relocated, um, unfortunately, they have been waiting a lot, like one year, one year and a half, in Greece, doing nothing in the camps. Uh, so the question there was how 
uh, how successful was the policy. Because, okay, you implement, you decide to have a policy within the EU, but uh, if, if, if the people have been there for a year and a year and a half, and, and the numbers, uh, the numbers were, was 120, 120, 120,000 from Italy and Greece, uh, I think. But the problem was that there was no political group from uh, the other EU member states to relocate. You have countries like Hungary that they decided not to be the factor, not to be part of the relocation mechanism. Or you have countries like um, Austria and um, Poland that decided to put some quota. So back at the time, there was a big discussion. Uh, there was a book, there was a big like blame game, I would say. How much Greece uh, is, how much, if, if Greece is doing enough, how much is being done by Greece? Italy is another thing, okay? The, the numbers were higher, the capacity in Italy is much higher, much different than in Greece. So I think that uh, the debate, the central, the, the debate should be around the responsibility sharing of the EU member states and the debate around issues like Islamophobia and the nationalism and populism and how far the EU member states were ready to accept uh, these this refugees, this asylum seekers that they wanted to be included in the relocation and they wanted to be protected according to treaties the Geneva that the EU member states uh, are abided by. As I said, I have an um, I'm also tired of this discourse. I mean, like saying, oh, the numbers are getting higher and higher. The numbers are not getting higher. I mean, if we look at it relatively, okay, international migration in 2005 was 3% of world population. Now it's 3.6% of world population. I mean, it is not like entire continents are packing up their suitcases and coming and invading other countries. So, I mean, there is like this discourse is not also helping us. I mean, it's not helping those who are in the field who are trying to do work, and it is not helping the refugees themselves. <coughs> and when I say 4%, I'm talking about the entire international migration numbers. I mean, if you look at those who need international protection within this, it is really small. I mean, and also if, if a country like Turkey, which is like 78 million people, can post three million, four million. I mean, like a continent like the EU, 500, 500 million people, right? Yes. Overall, can, can easily host more than 900,000 refugees. So, I mean, the, the, we should actually look at these things relatively. And I mean, and, and Turkey is still doing fine. I mean, if you look at Jordan, Lebanon, they are really having a lot of problems. Their resources are also very limited. I mean, we should always look at these things, I think, on like relative relative terms. I mean, this, with climate change, by the way, I totally agree with you. With the climate change, this discussion will change even further. Um, I should underline that Turkey is totally against, for example, the rhetoric of climate refugees. Because I know from uh, I know progress from the Minister of Foreign Affairs who claim that if we accept this rhetoric of climate refugees, like entire villages in Africa will you know, burn down their trees and claim that they are going to be climate refugees. So they are really afraid of that. They don't want to accept that as, as a cause of climate change. But that's the rhetoric. Yeah. I want, uh, I'm uh, Pilar Kamba, I'm a PhD candidate. Uh, I'm doing my thesis on uh, Congolese asylum seekers and migrants in Istanbul. Uh, I, I want to add some things from my uh, case to, uh, for example, after the readmission agreement, like you, you said, fatality rates increase. Uh, I think one of the reasons of that uh, is that uh, people they have to choose more uh, difficult and dangerous uh, seaways. For example, in 2013, with the big movement, many people 
has uh, used virtual cause rota. It was uh, less dangerous, but now they are using Chanakkale Lesbos, which is a very dangerous seaway. It's and uh, violence also increased uh, by state authorities, like you said. It also caused deportations. For example, I know many homeless people who were uh, deported to uh, DRC uh, a few uh, months ago. Uh, and I'm, I, I am also curious about the case uh, because when I'm talking with people, um, they are now a little blocked in Istanbul. They want to especially Congolese migrants, not all the African communities, but uh, most of the Congolese uh, migrants, they want to move to uh, Europe, and uh, they are articulating this as the road is closed. And, and one day they are saying that the road is open, the road is open now, and for example, for uh, three weeks now, uh, they are saying that the road is open, and uh, in many houses, homeless houses, I see that the people are uh, going now, are moving, are crossing. Uh, I don't, and uh, this is also deal with the, all these agreements, readmission agreements. And, uh, when I, they are articulating like this, that, that the road is open, the road is closed. I cannot understand that how the road is, can be open and closed like this. Uh, I want to say that, and I want to ask to Christina uh, that this um, uh, why don't uh, you let uh, that pass to mainland? Because I don't know the procedure of it. I'm also curious about it because I know people who, who are blocked in the islands more than uh, one year and. They want to move to uh, Athens, and they are uh, also now looking for false papers just to go in order to go to Athens. Uh, what is the reason behind it? I'm curious about it. Thank you. Okay, so basically, um, it's very interesting your research on Africans and Congolese. By the way, there are lots of Congolese um, mm -hmm. from uh, not from Brazil, uh, basically yes. Congo, yes. In, 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 in Athens and in Greece. So, very rapidly, what's the reason? The reason is that, as I told you, it's uh, it's an it's an imposed, I would say, EU policy to the Greek mm -hmm. government. It was the only way to stop the big flows uh, back at the time in 2015-2016 with the border closure. So before, when we had the borders open, people used to transit from the islands very easily. They had the Tegian ferry and then mainland and then Germany from the north or Patra, but the easiest way was to the north, to the Romania. So after the eu turkey deal and after the border closure, uh, it was decided uh, I don't want to comment on the decision making of how this policy was adopted by Brussels or by the Greek government, but it is a policy that it says that you know you don't have the right to go to the mainland unless you are vulnerable, as I explained before. So the situation right now is that you have this containment, containment policy implemented at the Eastern Aegean Islands. It is a, a containment policy. Uh, okay, there is a kind of unofficial freedom of movement, let's say, in, in, in Lesbos, in the islands. You can enter and exit Moria, detention center, but you cannot leave the island. So how this is compatible with uh, legal standards and freedom of circulation of, of an asylum seeker, I'm not so sure. So there, there is a very big uh, legal uh, issue there. But then again, it touches policy, I would say. Um, and, when, and when you said about the quotations, the only thing that I would like to comment on is the very new development which touches Greece and the Afghans most, it's mostly Afghans, with the new, the new uh, EU Afghanistan deal, there is a very big, uh, uh, let's say, contestated issue about how, 
how far Afghanistan can be considered a safe country. So you see that uh, you can see that the EU has um, uh, has speeded up the deportations to Afghanistan to specific, of course, regions of Afghanistan. Uh, and then, back at the time when I was working for the Greek Asylum Service, I remember we, we, we were giving much more, much easily refugee status to Afghanistan. Then the new, uh, let's say, directive uh, is that, and after the, the deal, Afghanistan can be considered as a safer country. So it's very easy to to deport them back to Afghanistan. There are some interesting stories about some pilots and some airlines, especially in Germany, that they resist this policy and they do not um, consent to the deportations. Maybe you could have a look at the case that we um, for your PhD. Uh, well, well, we should be ending with the last question, but I should say, you know, it's interesting because this issue raises a number of other issues. I mean, you mentioned problems, for example, it's something we want to try to launch at the CIS. So, a friend of mine uh, recently on Facebook put up a graph, which is it's very interesting. So, it's about response to US to estimate the share of immigrants in their country. And the Eurostat said, data about the real share of immigrants and what people think there is. So in Greece, for example, the share is about 8.4% of the population, and people estimate it's about 20%. Uh, Hungary, Hungary has 2%. 2% of the population of Hungary are immigrants. And of course, because of populism, um, in Hungary, uh, people think it's 8.8% of the average. Uh, Poland, which has a 1.1% of population of immigrants, people think it's 10%. Britain, where you have Brexit, but the real number is 8.6%, while 21% people think it's actually 21%. So it's incredible, the, the, and, and in fact, this, the estimate is a factor of 2 to 1. And I think this is also something that feeds into the debate about Europe being unable, because you're, you're right, it's, the numbers are so small. That all Obviously, Europe could accommodate that. The problem is that refugee flows have not necessarily, uh, globally, have not necessarily grown. I mean, that's why at the beginning I was also uh, asking for crisis, because it's a question of perception. The crisis, because it's hit Greece. Italy is better prepared because it's been dealing with this much longer than Greece. So, that is also another dimension, the populism dimension, uh, and how this affects societies. And and, uh, and this complicates initiatives like Merkel's initiative and, and the fact that countries had agreed upon where to relocate and now are going back on the agreement, which is what had happened initially, right? So last question. Uh, my name is Yes, I'm from Hall for TT. Uh, first of all, thanks for your informative present the presentations. Uh, I have a few questions. My first question will be about um, Turkey and EU deal. So you told that, as I understood from your presentations, um, the implementation of the deal is not uh, is not meeting with its aims. So are there control mechanisms for this deal? Um, and my second question: uh, Would you give me the names of the non-governmental organizations which are dealing with? Um, this this problem. Uh, yeah, this is just. Could you give the, Could you give us the name? This what? problem, like migration. In yeah. Japan? Yeah. Wow. I mean, if you ask me in 2008 when I first entered into the field, I could count ten. Yeah. yeah also was one here in CR, but now I mean there are thousands. Uh, this is an industry now in Turkey. I can. Find you many, many. I mean, not, not, all of, not all of the names. That's why it's like which specific issue you had in mind. Sorry, I don't which know. Which specific issue you are interested in? Refugees. And law, for me. And yeah. law. Because he said law to them. Yeah. Okay. You want to. I mean, uh, I, want to be, I want to be a volunteer in ah. summer, so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. 
that's a very interesting question, and that's good that you want to volunteer in <laughs> Turkey, because there are volunteer initiatives in Turkey as well, in Greece as well. So the, I agree with Denise, she said that NGOs is an interesting industry in Turkey, not only in Turkey, after the emergency, it became an industry in, in, in Greece, and the problem was that there was not enough, of course there was not legislative framework in Greece, and also there was a lack of monitoring of NGOs, who gets the money, who is doing what on the ground, uh, who is advocating who. Now, the, the situation of the islands, because you said you want to go in Samos, Samos? Yes. the islands, anyway. Um, is that if you have if you have an NGO, uh, you have to register to the national authorities, to the municipality, uh, and you need to say what are you going to do and who from whom you're going to get your funding. Uh, so this is another discussion: who has got what on the ground, and how much of this money, of this funding, is channeled to, directly to the beneficiaries. Was, there was a very interesting report from Human Rights Watch, I think one year, one year and a half, and there were stories from the refugees, maybe you could have a look, because it's uh, the voice of refugees in the baby in the reports. And most of them, they were saying that, you know what, uh, so many people have come from INGOs and local NGOs, and the only thing that I want is a pair of shoes, nothing else, and nobody has been able to give me this pair of, of simple shoes, you know, that I want in order to avoid walking, uh, uh, yes, uh, in, yes, in winter time. So this is something, uh, of course, very simplistic that I described to you, but this is reality on the ground. So when it comes to legal aid organizations uh, in, in Greece, this is a very big gap in the system, okay? Number one, because uh, we have lawyers in Greece, but uh, they don't want to do refugee law, or they are not very much experts in refugee law. It's a very specific, let's say, a very new uh, sector. Um, yes, yes. And number two, if you want to go in volunteer, realistically speaking, you need to be sustainable financially. Most of the law students, because they're not based at the islands, they cannot do that. So the easiest way is to be based at the islands. So when it has to do with uh, with Lesbos, and I think with most of the islands, we have two main NGOs. Uh, it's Metadas NGO and GCR, Greek Refugees, uh, Greek Council for Refugees. Of course, there are lots of law lawyers and lots of projects right now running on the ground, sustained uh, and supported by German colleagues, by uh, Dutch colleagues, uh, by different bar associations. I would say that the bar, the bar associations they are not so much involved in Greece on legal aid initiatives. But if you want to be based on the ground, uh, you can find the things there are. I can give you some more information. Thanks. Okay. Well, I like to thank uh, our two speakers. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, for your presentation, for the videos, and uh, for your uh, participation today. And I think. I'm trying to think how much, what else we can do as, uh, as the CIS to generate interest rate, which I think is the most uh, difficult part, right? The most generate interest in the day. Thank you again.